بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله يا رب العالمين وبه نستعين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We will be reciting from Surah Al-An'am verses 91 to 94 page number 139 Surah Al-An'am Surah number 6 of the Quran verse number 91 to 94 أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما خدم الله حق خدمه إذ قالوا ما أنزل الله على بشر من شيء قل من أنزل الكتاب الذي جاء تجعلونه قراطي ستبدونها وتخفون كثيرا وعلمتم ما لم تعلموا أنتم ولا آباؤكم قل الله ثم ذرهم في خوضهم يلعبون وهذا كتاب
that the um, selection of surahs, who say that Surah al nas should be the last surah, and Surah Al-Fatiha should be the first surah, and that the Surah Yasin should be the 36th surah of the Holy Quran, is that the Prophet of Allah say that this is how they should be placed? Or is it the Sahaba who came after the Holy Prophet, they decided upon the placement of the surahs of the Quran? Our scholars say, when it comes to the verses in one surah, we believe it's the Prophet of Allah who placed every verse in its place. If you find a verse at the beginning, it's because the Prophet wanted it to be there, and God wanted it to be there. If you find a verse at the end, it's because the Prophet wanted it to be there, because God wanted it to be there. There is a particular reasoning behind it. As for the surahs of the Qur'an, well there there is a discussion. Some say the way it is right now in the Qur'an, the Prophet of Allah placed them in that particular manner. Some say no, after the Prophet of Allah, the Muslims decided which surahs they wanted to place, where in the Qur'an, and it doesn't really make a difference whether one surah comes first or the other comes last. Allama Taba Tabai was of the opinion that no, the Prophet of Allah generally laid down the structure of the surahs. He said that the long surah should come first, the musabbahat, the surah that begins with yusabbihu or sabbaha, should come towards the middle, for example. The smaller surah should come towards the end. But then the exact details of it, perhaps that was decided later on. In any case, the reason I bring up this whole particular discussion is because Surah Al-An'am, if you remember, we say it is a surah which is Makki. However, these verses that we are reciting today, they are verses which are Madani. I'll tell you the reason why they were revealed. The question you will ask is, how can verses which were revealed in Medina come in a surah which was revealed in Mecca, generally speaking? And this is because the Prophet of Allah particularly said that though these verses have been revealed in Medina, they should be placed in Surah Al-An'am, in this place of Surah Al-An'am, which was generally revealed in Mecca. Okay. So what happened in Medina? <coughs> And the Prophet of Allah came to Medina. He said to the people who are in Medina that a book has been revealed to me. And the book is, that the book is the Qur'an. So some of the Jewish tribes, or maybe the Christian tribes, they came to the Holy Prophet and they asked him, you claim to be a prophet? He said, yes. They say, you claim that a book has been revealed to you? The Prophet said, yes. They say to him, we don't know of any book that has been revealed before you. God does not reveal books to his Prophets. Now immediately a question should come to your mind. How can this narration be an authentic narration? Because we know that the Jewish people believe in the Torah. And we know Torah has been revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they are Christians, they will believe in the Bible. And we know that the Injil has been revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. will answer that question. But when they first came and made that claim that God doesn't reveal books, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately responded, مَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ إِذْ قَالُ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَى بَشْرٍ مِنْ شَيْءٍ They have not recognized God as He ought to be recognized. You know, sometimes <clears throat> when somebody comes to you and says, Well, I didn't expect you that you would be so generous. I didn't expect that you would forgive me. I didn't expect that you would answer me when I call out to you. What do you say to that person sometimes? You say, you don't know me. You have not recognized me. You don't know what my character is like. If you knew me, you would also know that I would have forgiven you. I would have been generous to you. When they say that God would not reveal a book that guides humanity, God is saying, then you don't know who God is. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created the heavens and the earth with such meticulous detail what do you think he created all of this for? He created it for human beings. So that human beings would find salvation and find their purpose in life. And when human beings become confused, then it is the responsibility of God to send a messenger that would remove their confusion, that would bring them back to the right path. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, This is a sha'an of Allah. قُلْ مَنْ أَنزَلَ الْكِتَابَ الَّذِي جَاءَ بِهِ مُوسَى If you say, that God has not sent any book, then tell me, who has sent the book that Prophet Musa brought? 
nuran wa hudan lin nas as a source of light and a source of guidance for human beings taj'alunahum qawatisa tuhdunaha wa tuhfuna kathira you just use it as paper that you turn you don't give it as much importance we'll see today in the quran it is important that muslims give special value to the quran to a book which has been revealed by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never ever compare the quran to any other book never ever say i can get from the quran what i can get from other books you will see the verses coming right now what to do now what to fool a kathira and you actually hide a lot you will say how is it possible that they hide the torah and they hide the injil is it possible to hide the quran from the people it's not possible right from the early days of islam muslims were reciting the quran in their salat they were reciting the quran after their salat they were carrying quran with them they're keeping a copy of the quran in their house they would begin their program with the recitation of the quran they were told to do hifz of the quran the quran was so prevalent you couldn't hide it from the people wouldn't it be the same with the torah and with the injil so actually it turns out that the torah and injil were not made accessible to the common people they were only accessible to the scholars even for example in the 12 1300s they were written in latin and the people could not read latin and people were saying that we want you to translate the bible into our language whether it's french or italian or english or german so that we the common people can also read the bible as well and the scholars would not do that and one of the reasons why gutenberg made the printing press if you go and read about it was because he wanted to take copies of the bible and he wanted to translate it and publish it and put it into each and every household that was a revolutionary idea the reason why we have a protestant movement there were only catholics at the time right the reason why we have a protestant movement one of the things that they were protesting is to say we also want to be able to read the bible for ourselves wa tuhuna kathira and you hide it, a lot of it wa ulimtum ma lam ta'lamu antum wa la aba'ukum if you don't think that the torah was revealed by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then how can you have some knowledge which you neither knew nor your forefathers were able to know knowledge about the hereafter knowledge about laws laws which you could not have come up with it with your self now coming back to that question <coughs> don't jews and christians believe that the torah and the injil are books revealed by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so actually we've talked about this <coughs> the bible itself is not one book it is a collection of books in the old testament there are 30 40 odd books in the new testament there are certain books as well do christians believe that the new testament was written by prophet isa the answer is no they were written either by the disciples of prophet isa or the students of the disciples of prophet isa okay now when they wrote this book is it what they heard from prophet isa and the answer is some of it they heard for example the bible contains the parables of jesus well they heard about the parables of jesus but when they were writing it down the jesus said this those words what they chose to write down what they chose not to write down was that something that prophet isa told them write it this way and the answer is no they believe that this was an inspiration that god gave to these writers to john to mark to matthew to luke and therefore a part of it is an inspiration from god and a part of it has human touch to it it's this person's own thoughts it's his own experience it is his own selection and choice as well So they don't believe that it's a book that was revealed to these people or revealed to prophet Isa either, right? And that's why the Quran says that they came to the prophet and they say God has not revealed a book. Wa hadha kitabun anzalnahu mubarakun musaddiq alladhi bayna yadayhi. And this is a book of prophet that we have revealed to you. Very important. The Quran its words and ideas have not been touched by human thought have not been influenced by human thought its ideas have been 
purely defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes some of the mufassireen of the Qur'an, they say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he is speaking in the Qur'an, he not only makes use of Arab language, but he also makes use of Arab culture and Arab understanding as well. For example, when the Qur'an talks about shayateen, back then they would think that shaytan would do these things. For example, if a person became mentally unstable, they would believe that shaytan made him mentally unstable. Therefore, God used the term shaytan. If you do these things, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish you by making you mentally unstable the way the shayateen make you mentally unstable. Then they say that, well, today, for example, we understand people don't become mentally unstable because of shayateen. They become mentally unstable because of what? Well, there are reasons for it. Nature or nurture. But there are actually reasons for it. It's not shaytan who makes it happen. Therefore, at that time, God borrowed some of their concepts which weren't right concepts. But today we understand that is not the case. Such an explanation has no place in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَهَذَا كِتَابٌ أَنْزَلْنَاهُ This is a book that we have revealed. There is no room for batil in it. مُبَارَكٌ It is blessed. مُصَدِّقُ الَّذِي بَيْنَ يَدَيْ It confirms what came before it. لِتُنْذِرَ أُمَّ الْقُرَى وَمَنْ حَوْلَهَا for what purpose? So that you may warn Umm al Qura. Qura means a land. A land which is alive. A land where people live. A land where there is vegetation, there is life, there is society. Umm al Qura, the first of the lands. Now, the first of the lands refers to which one? To Mecca. Why to Mecca? Remember Dahul Arab? Dahul Arab, the place where the land first appeared and then afterwards spread out to the rest of the world, appeared over water, right? Where did Dahul Arab occur? Okay. Right, the Kaaba, right? So Umm al Qura refers to Mecca, Waman Hawlaha, and the lands around it refers to? First, the rest of the world, by the way. Right? The Prophet of Allah came as a messenger to the rest of the world. And you know who's going to believe in the Quran? The people who believe that life is purposeful. The people who believe that there is an akhirah وَهُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِظُونَ And they observe their salat. They are very observant about their salat. The next verse, and we'll end with that, inshallah. We're almost out of time. They say that the Prophet of Allah had a scribe. The scribe would write down ayat of the Qur'an. But one of these scribes, by the name of <coughs> Abdullah ibn Sa'ad, he betrayed the Prophet of Allah. And he stopped being a scribe. Not only he stopped being a scribe, after a while he says, just as the Holy Prophet has verses that are revealed to him, I also get verses that are revealed to me. And he started writing down his own verses. Or some of them say, no, it's not about Abdullah ibn Sa'ad. Towards the end of the Prophet's life, he used to send messengers to go to different tribes in Arabia and invite them towards Islam. One of these messengers went to Musaylama, who was a leader of a tribe. And he said to him, I invite you to the Prophet Muhammad, and you're supposed to pay certain taxes to him as well. Musaylama decided that he was not going to accept. Or he became a Muslim, but then he did not want to pay the taxes. Right? So he wrote back after a while, and he said, this is a letter from Musaylama, the Prophet of God, to Muhammad, the Prophet of God. <laughs> so he claimed himself to be a Prophet, along with Muhammad, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So, and he said, I, I call upon you as my brother. Like Haqqan and Musa, they are prophets at the same time. And Musaylam also claimed the same. So in Islamic history, is given a special title. His title is Musaylam al kadhab Musaylam the liar. And he said, well, just as the Prophet receives divine revelation, I also receive divine revelation. So these verses were revealed. Woman Allah and who can be more oppressive? Look, it's one thing for you to say that I'm not going to accept the message. It's another thing for you to, do, to misguide a whole community of people. This is what they were doing. So Allah said, who can be more oppressive than the one who fabricates lies 
and he attributes them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or he says that it is revealed to me and nothing is revealed to him, or the one who makes fun and says, I shall also reveal certain verses the way God reveals certain verses. What's the message that the Quran is trying to give us over here? The message it's trying to give us is to say that this book is a very unique book. It's a very profound book. The values that you find in the Quran, you're not going to find anywhere else. The beliefs that you find in the Quran, don't ever think that you will find it in any other book written in the past <coughs> or written in the present. It's very important. Before we read the Quran, we have to first convince ourselves that this book is something special then it's going to have an impact upon our hearts. We also have to be careful when we're comparing the Qur'an to other books. Okay? Sometimes we do that and we don't even realize that we're doing that. For example, sometimes, let us say that you're working in an Islamic organization and you want to make an announcement and you need a quote. You're making a flyer and you need a quote. You're talking to people and you want to draw from certain quotes. You have a choice. Either to take a quote from the Quran or Hadith, or to take a quote from a, you know, a, a celebrity or a philosopher who may not even be a Muslim. But when you choose to take a quote from a celebrity or a philosopher and put that on your flyer, or put that into your speech, or put that into your announcement, <laughs> What you're saying over there is what? I found that to be more inspirational than what I could have found in the Qur'an. We have to be careful not to do that. We have to make sure that when we are preaching, when we're talking, when we're announcing, we are teaching from the Thaqalain. Kitab Allah wa Itrati Ahlu Bayti. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.